Hello and welcome to the second webinar of the Automation Academy. This was a Zoom webinar held on December 4th, 2020, and we discussed machine simulation using a PLC and HMI, and then got into a general discussion on systems integration with some questions and answers. There were five attendees in addition to myself, mostly members here at the Automation Academy. Hope you enjoy it. Good morning and welcome to the second webinar at the Automation Academy. The subject today will be machine simulation. And at this point, I have no idea if anybody's going to show up. But in any case, the meeting starts at 10 o'clock my time. It is currently about 9.58. So we'll wait a little bit, see if somebody shows up and then get going. Seb in. Let me make sure I've got my audio on. Are you there? I am there. How are you, Frank? Hey, pretty good. How are you? I'm doing good, man. Doing good. So can you see my screen? I, yep, I can definitely see your screen. Absolutely. It has in feed screen right now. Yeah, cool. So, uh, yeah, so I, I scheduled this and didn't really know what I was going to talk about last week, and I didn't have a lot of input. So I kind of uh, decided to do it on a previous uh, simulation that I did, which looked like this. Gotcha. And this is actually uh, recorded in the Automation Academy. It's in a RS Logics 500 video, um, that Odyssey series. So the general idea was uh, I simulated everything. Of course, don't have a real um, uh, mock-up of this, you know, little plastic conveyors or anything. So everything is fed back from the PLC. And the general idea was you'd place a part here and it would move down the conveyor uh, when it reaches this point, it would push and get inspected with the camera. And if it passed, it would continue on down the conveyor. And if it failed, it would get pushed into a reject bin. So pretty simple application. And then I added this gate. And in the case of, uh, let me show you something I've got here. Uh, let's see, can you? Can you see my little camera here? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. So these are the uh, the trainers that I build. The, this thing that's right right back here. Yeah. Notice it's got an e stop on it, uh, and and it actually has a little MCR inside of it. So it's a bit of a step up uh, above some of the you know little suitcase trainers that you normally use. Um, so the reason I do that. Is be and there's also a stack light on it. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little, and it's hard to really hard to see. Um, but there's a little uh, light stack light right down here. Gotcha. Uh, yep. See it. Mm -hmm. so it's your typical red, yellow, green stack light. And I build these these little trainers myself, but I also teach uh, for a company called Automation Training, and they use these little suitcases like down here. So gotcha. inside of those, the only thing there is, is, uh, you know, push buttons and pilot lights. And uh, that's pretty much it, a little potentiometer. So I built these trainers so that I could teach uh, kind of as you and I discussed over the uh, email, a little more of a real machine control type of class. In other words, you know, what happens when you hit the e-stop? Um, you know, you lose air. You lose power to your outputs. So I try to kind of incorporate that into the class. And that's what this was about. So in addition to the e-stop, I also have this little gate. And so, hey, we got another one. Look at that. We got three of us now. Cool. Nice. Cool. Hey, Phil, how you doing? Hey, good morning. I see hey, someone else here. So Seven is also from here. Uh, he works in some kind of a technical field, but I'm not exactly sure what. You and I talked a while ago. Seven, uh, maybe something to do with systems integration, probably more on the programming side. Is that true, Seven? Yeah, so I, I did that in a my past job, but right now I currently do a little bit of uh, distribution and programming work on the side. So 
uh, I work for a distributor, but more in the programming division versus the sales side of things. So, uh, okay. yep. So uh, I generally work with servos and um, PLCs, things like that. Okay, cool. So, um, so yeah, Phil and I were the only ones on, you know, last week, and we kind of just talked about the academy. It was a, a, a kind of a general discussion, and Phil's been kind enough to help me with some of this stuff. Uh, didn't have anybody to talk to, you know, before I did several webinars this summer. I think I did four of them. And in the grand total, I had three attendees in four webinars. So, and, and they only attended for part of them. So this is the first time I've had two people on, which is cool. But uh, in any case, so what, what this was, this is a full recording in the Automation Academy. It was done with a, uh, the trainer, as I pointed out, had a little e-stop to it. Um, and uh, it, I used the, the little trainers behind me and they have, uh, you know, some push buttons and pilot lights and things, um, but they don't have an HMI. So I do make trainers with HMIs also, which makes it easier, right? Because you could push a button and turn the conveyor on, you could jog it, um, you could stop it, things like that. So what I decided to do is um, when I created this, logics uh control logics odyssey video i decided to kind of take it a step further right um but i i'm reusing the same uh layout right that i that i did in the rs logics 500 video so the general idea is like i said four photo eyes um pushers conveyors and a little inspect area the cool thing about this inspect area, it's something that I do in my simulations that I don't know that other people do, is I, um, I simulate, I do a random number generator, right? So, uh, and I have this, I think in my book, Seven, do you have my book? I, I do have your book, yep, sure yeah, do. I thought, I thought so, because you mentioned something about, a little bit about object-oriented programming, which there is a little bit on that in there, right on program structure. Um, although it's not so much mentioned as object-oriented programming, but that's one of the things I kind of wanted to cover here. Um, if you are doing RS Logics 500, you almost can't do object-oriented programming in any meaningful way, right? Because it's all separate files. So there's an integer file and there's a, a, a floating point file and there's bit files, right? But you can't really package those together. I can't put bits and words and things together in one package and say, this represents a conveyor, right? right. So right. That's part of the object oriented part that you can do with control logics that you can't do easily with 500. Now you sort of can, for instance, I can create extra integer files and extra bit files and things in the simpler programs and I can say, for instance, I do a lot of work in Miami, and I would say um, this, this fluid tank consists of this integer file, this timer file, and this um, uh, bit file, right, and these counters. So I can sort of say this group of those things are attached to this tank, and then I can just duplicate those things, and so all the tanks have their own integer files and everything else, but they're not really packaged together. They're just... Um, files and they're in numerical order. You know, I have files in there like, you know, file 110 and file 111 and fire, file 112. It doesn't mean anything. It's like one bit file and one integer file. But in, in Logics Designer, you can do that. You can group things together, right? Um, and you guys probably know about this, but you have these uh, UDTs, right? Which is part of um, the IEC 61131 regulation of what a PLC should be. That's, that's you know, part of the definition now that didn't exist back when the Slick 500 and the original Siemens came out was to say, um, you know, we, timers will time up, for instance. They won't time down like Siemens do. Um, and they will be in milliseconds. They won't have a time base like Logix 500 does. Logix 500, you know, has something that you say, okay, I want it to count in point oh one second increments or one second increments. And that was because the timers only had 30,000, uh, you know, value to work with. You can only time up to about 30,000. Well, if you wanted to do 
60 seconds in milliseconds, you couldn't do that with an integer, right? There weren't enough numbers in there. So with control logics, it's completely IEC compliant, which means you can use UDTs, which is uh, user defined data types. And indeed, um, Alan Bradley does that a lot. So not only can you make your own data types, but they have a lot of their own data types. Let me see if I've got my other tag. Yeah, here's the controller tags. So for instance, every time you make a, a new card, right, it, it throws these data types in there. Oh my gosh, we got a fourth person. We got Jet also. That is cool. So this is definitely more than we had last week. So, um, so this is uh, um, Alan Bradley's, you know, I call them ABDTs, I suppose, instead of UDTs. Um, that this is an AB defined structure and inside of it, it includes the actual data for the input, right? So that's their method of object and object that this object in this case, local uh, I and C would represent the card. Well, it looked like we had Jet and now we don't have Jet. He logged in and then he's back out. Um, but in any case, this, um, this is how, you know, Alan Bradley does their things. And then you can make your own UDTs. So for instance, uh, in Miami, I do a lot of work down there and I imported these, these UDTs um, just from a group that I had just for this, this demo and for the logics video that I'm making. Um, and here's one of them. I start mine a lot of times with a lowercase u, but what it looks like, uh, this is a simple one. This would be a date and time. So it's got a year, a month, a day, hour, minute, and second. That would be a good indication of packaging the time of day and the month into a, basically an object, right? It's a, a user defined data type. And they'll give you some data types too, but you can make your own more complicated ones like this one. So this is for data tracking, which I know Phil, uh, I think, does some, some uh, data tracking. And this is one that I had to build for the Miami, um, the Miami job that I'm doing down there to track batches of juice. That's basically what they make is, is batches of juice. So I need to know the batch number, which dissoluter number it came from. There's a one or two. And you type all this stuff in to describe whatever it is that you're, that you're building, right? So transfer line number, pasteurizer filler number, the time that it started, time fill transfer start, time, you know, batch complete, things like that. So logging times, you know, uh, occurrences and things. But in any case, um, so the simulation part of this, let's get back to that. The simulation part of this was to simulate this. And what I thought I'd do, uh, I have not finished this program yet for control logics. I've only finished it for 500. Um, so in the control logics part, I have written a little part of the program, right? Uh, I did structure the program. It's got an auto sequence, things like that, but I don't have a lot of the stuff in there. What I do have is I did, uh, some simulation stuff. This is the start of the infeed screen, right? I was just in the process of building this screen. It's got a little package and it comes down and I'm gonna have another photo eye here and another photo eye here like that picture. But uh, this doesn't really do anything yet because I don't have the program behind it. Um, what it will do, right? Here's the main screen, by the way. I did the auto manual, the cycle start, stop. That's on a video in there. It's got a little fake stack light. I couldn't do this easily with the RS Logics 500 because I didn't have a touch screen. But I did have the demo that's behind me. So this one, um, you know, we'll have push buttons and things, but what I did do is I set up a cool little simulation test yesterday to illustrate some of the things that you can simulate. So for instance, when I get to this screen and I wanna move this package down this, this uh, conveyor, right? So how do I do that? Well, you can animate these objects and you can do a variety of things with them. You can change their color, you can um, make them move along a path. Um, you can change their size. You can make them visible or invisible. 
right? So those kind of things are things that you would animate. So for example, um, this is actually two objects. And when I want to push this thing off, I will move this here, right? It'll follow a path and it'll look like this pusher cylinder extended and this box went here. Okay, so I'll have a reject bin and then this thing will need to come back, right? So it'll be here. So that's the general idea behind animating all these things. So what I figured I'd do, since I don't have all this done, right, it's not moving yet, uh, the, the logic for doing that is actually in the RS Logics 500 video. So if you wanna see how the logic would work to move the cylinder out, how to run this conveyor and move the object along it, you can see that there. But uh, let's get back to this screen, which is the simulation screen. Uh, I don't know how much you guys do with touch screens, this is an Allen Bradley uh, Panel View Plus, which the fun thing about this is I can run this on my desktop just like as if I had the real HMI. So I can test it, I can run the full application, or I can simply test the individual screens. So what I'm doing up here is if I test the display, it's active and it actually interfaces with the PLC. So Here's one that I'm using an internal tag, right? So if I move this slider, I define the, the movement of the slider and then this ball follows the slider. It also follows this slider. Okay, so I can move the ball anywhere in that white area by doing that. I can also pin this to the PLC, and here's how I did that. This, this red ball uh, right now is actually following, I believe, the PLC. The way we can test that is if I shut this off, right, it moves back. And that says that uh, when it, it was defined here, that's, this is like the zero, zero point. So I defined it here, and then the PLC tells it, move over here. This, these sliders tell this to move here, right? These are entirely internal. So I have an internal tag here called like ball position vertical and ball position horizontal. Um, let's actually, I'll show you that. If I go to this animation, horizontal position, I have a, a internal tag called horiz pos, right? Horizontal position. And I have another internal tag called vertical position. This one, if I go to the animation, it is pinned into the PLC, which is a like a topic. Now there's Jet again. So it's like a topic sort of. And uh, so I'm picking the topic PLC, I'm picking the uh, item within that main program, and then this is the tag within that. So uh, symbol horizontal is over here in the PLC, and I actually built a little operator interface here. So this is just running an emulator. It's not a real uh, PLC at all. And I ran a simulation program. I just made a routine called sim. And this is something I like to do sometimes, um, again, that is really hard to do in um, RS Logics 500. But in Control Logics, you have a no-op, which is a, it's a coil that does, it does nothing, right? It's a no-operation coil. Uh, I can't do that uh, in, in Logics 500. I have to have a coil of some kind there, whereas here I can have a coil that does nothing. What this does is allows me to basically have a, um, a, an operator interface. So if I toggle this bit, now, uh, let's see, close that. And you can see this ball moving automatically. All it's doing is following um, a timer value, right? And so what I did is I defined when the timer's at zero, it's here. When it's at 100, it's here. And it follows a, a one second path. So the logic behind that looks like this. 
right? So this is one of the easiest possible pieces of logic. If you guys don't know this, this is one you would want to memorize. It's a free running timer. So it's just a timer in series with its own done bit normally closed, right? Which makes it repeat. So I have a one second timer here. I have a two second timer here. And I, I allow the vertical and horizontal movement, right? I actually have to scale it uh, since it goes up to 2000 and I didn't want to uh, define a 2000 position. I divide it by 10, right? So it goes zero to a thousand and I get a zero to a hundred. So that position zero through position 100. Divide this one by 20 and I get position uh, zero through 100 here also. If I activate both of these, go up to the operator interface. Oh, here's another trick. So you see me scrolling up and down here. And again, this is particular to Alan Bradley, but um, this is a neat thing you can do. I don't know if you knew that if you use logics, but uh, this is a split screen, and now my operator interface is at the top, and I can scroll up and down underneath it, right? But I can get back to the operator interface here. So I'm gonna make both of them active. Okay, so now if I go to my simulation, and it's kind of moving, moving funny. So you, you see you can move an object basically however you want to. I could make this object follow a certain path on the screen by pinning it to different timers and moving numbers into the registers however I would need to. So that's the general idea behind it. Um, and then if I deactivate either one of those timers, then it will only move vertically or only move horizontally. So I guess you get the idea behind all that. The specifics to it, um, like I said, this will all be eventually in a video, just kind of a general uh, control logic simulation video from starting a project until finishing. And I think I have three modules or gosh, maybe more now uh, already in here on this. Um, other things you can do for simulation. Um, this one's kind of fun. Uh, this is Mayor McCheese. I'm gonna turn these off because they're annoying when they're moving across the screen all the time. So I go back to my simulation and the balls have stopped moving and here's Mayor McCheese. So the Mayor McCheese was just what I wanted to do here. This is just testing my own uh, theories here. I moved an object in here for, um, right, for, that was a label. So let's move it up so you can see it. Come on now, there we go. So this was, this just happened to be in the objects library. And I wanted to see, can I resize it? And the answer is no. Even though I can resize it on the screen, right? I can drag him bigger. The animation will not allow me to resize it. Okay, so what did I do? I had to create my own Mayor McCheese. That Mayor McCheese is composed of a bunch of objects, right? They're all separate objects. And amazingly, it will allow me to resize it. So this is one of the things that if you're animating, you got to know, okay, I can't, I can't use some of their library objects. I can't, for instance, make the conveyor longer. That would be kind of cool if I had a, a conveyor and I could extend it or something. I, I can't do that. I can move it, but it has to stay the size that it is. So I didn't know that. So the best way to experiment with that, and I'll kind of show you what I did, if I... Uh, test this, the first thing I did is I made either one Mayor McCheese uh, visible or the other one visible. So if I go in here and change to the other guy, then the other one's visible. And uh, what this does is it scales to this number. So if I wanna make him really big, this is again, uh, zero to 100. He's bigger, okay? So, so I can scale this as long as I group it, I can scale it uh, where I couldn't scale the labeled Mayor McCheese. You know? So I don't know why I put that in there instead of something else, but um, that, that's who I used was Mayor McCheese. He was the only guy available, I guess. So, uh, so that's another type of simulation you can do. You can make things different sizes. Um, 
I'm not really sure where I would use that um, because most things like if I'm filling a tank, I don't want to change the size so much. Instead, I would want to use a, uh, like a bar graph. Basically, you'd take a tank and you'd have a bar graph and if it's empty, the bar graph's at the bottom and when it gets full, it, it's up at the top, right? So that's a little simpler. It's not so much a size change, but think of your own application. Anytime you need to simulate something, do I need to make something bigger? Uh, you can, obviously, with, with this, as long as it's not a, a canned object from their library. You have to build your own little picture. Um, other things I can do here. Uh, this one, what I did is I, I cycled through a whole bunch of colors. Um, how did I do that? Uh, each one of these colors, we'll go ahead and look at the animation properties of this. Each one of those colors is a different number. So I pinned it to something called sim colors, and then I put a number to each one of the colors, and then I simply cycle through the numbers. So here's a way to reuse code. Uh, where did I do? Oh, if you want to know how to find where sim colors is generated, which is on this same page, I happen to know it, but go to the cross reference, it shows you everywhere it is. And of course, where you'd want to go is the destructive bit. So I'd want to go to where it's changed. And all I did was take that free running timer and scale it. And you can see here it goes zero through 10. Uh, if I change the scaling, I think if I go a little lower, I can go zero through 12, which is actually the colors that I put in there. But that's, so that's another property you can change is the colors. Um, as far as the inspection, so I want to simulate an inspection. Uh, you can see behind me on this, this thing, these are Cognex cameras, okay, which uh, you guys may have worked with before. I don't know, but this is a Cognex machine vision system, and you can inspect parts and basically give, uh, I can do dimensions. I can get uh, uh, all kinds of information from it, but the basic idea behind it is it's gonna pass or fail. And so what I'm simulating here, and we'll do this, review this, I don't think Jet has seen this, but this is the system. So I have a camera here, and I wanna inspect the part when it gets here. And uh, in my old um, lab, I had a big fake factory, and I had this camera, same camera, perched over a, a box, and inside of the box were different colored balls. And I would let people working on that little imitation factory um, try to discern, have you got the wrong color ball? You'd have these, um, these little dispensers and they would dispense balls into a little box and then you'd inspect the box to make sure that you hadn't gotten one of the wrong balls in the, in the thing. Well, I never really got to it before the uh, tornado hit. So I, I actually put a little simulation um, program to simulate the camera. And what it would do is randomly pass or fail the boxes to make sure that the, the students would have their, uh, you know, their movements all correct. So if it, if the box passed, there was a pick in place, it would take it and set it on a uh, conveyor and it would move one direction if it passed and it would move the other direction if it failed. So that was the idea behind that little factory. But because I didn't have the, the camera done in time, uh, I, I do this a little simulation. And people would say, well, with a PLC, uh, there's really nothing random in a PLC. Even though, for instance, if I look at this timer, that looks pretty random, but it's repeating, right? No doubt it's repeating very precisely every two seconds. Now, there's some imprecision in that. What you see here is a screen update. And then also, if I move it into a register, when does it move it, right? You have the scan time of the PLC, which is another random number. But how can I generate a random number, for instance, representing a percentage, which is what I would do for a camera? I would say, if, if you put 82% pass, then I want 18% of the parts to randomly fail and randomly go down that conveyor. So how do you do that? Well. 
there's nothing random in the PLC, but there is something random in the human being. So to illustrate that, I built a little random number generator here and we'll run it. It is this dice roller. So, and what I did, of course, is just generate a number in the, uh, in the PLC part, but here, um, I've kind of taken it to the extra step and I'm randomly generating the number one through six. And it is truly random. And it's what it's based on is when you press the button and when you let go of the button. Right, so it's quite random. And the way that I did that is, let me go in here. This is pretty simple. Again, this is in the book. I know Seven has the book. Um, so what I do here is you have a push button and on a one shot, um, I move the free running timer. Now this is a very specific free running timer. It's not one of these 1000 ones. It's, uh, it's actually set to, let's see. It has to be set to a multiple of six, right? Because I'm rolling dice and I want an even chance of one through six. So to make it very precise, I made it zero through 359 and it's a free running timer, quite random as far as the number it's gonna put in there. That is only 0.36 seconds. So your chance of timing that perfectly is very low. Uh, so what I do is I take a one shot and whatever that value is, I divide it by 60, I add one to it, there is one case in which the, uh, it's greater than six. If I hit exactly 360, uh, then it actually generates a seven. Sometimes it will round up. So to make sure of that, if it uh, rounds to a seven, it will uh, move a six in it anyway. So that's what this logic does. Pretty straightforward. Um, you would have to kind of run this yourself, but you could see how, for instance, you could generate a random number from zero to 100 or one, one to 100, zero through 99, whatever you'd wanna do to generate a percentage. So that's the general idea there. And what I do, it, the random part of that is, if you, uh, whenever you set the part on this conveyor, it's going to move through here, it's gonna randomly push in here and I would run it on a say 100 milliseconds instead of 0.36 seconds. Maybe I'd run it, uh, just get a, a chance of zero to 100 and uh, divide it out. And whenever the part lands here, that's when it generates the number. Uh, I could, in addition, if I wanted to, I would trigger the camera, give it a half a second and say that simulates how long it took for the camera to generate its result and get to me. If it passes, it keeps going down the conveyor, and if it fails, it goes over here. So that's what I'm gonna be simulating here. Um, and again, all this is in the um, one of the courses, it's in that RS500 uh, Odyssey course, which I appended to the end of the RS500 uh, course also. So that's been about a half hour of, of the meeting for, you know, kind of how, what I'm doing on simulation. Do you guys have any, any questions or comments on this, or do you have anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, so I, I guess my question, or at least with this simulation case, is, um, you know, you mentioned like an 80% pass-fail rate for, or, you know, pass rate versus a 20% fail. So how, how would you simulate the randomness of the box based on a 20% fail rate, if that makes any sense. So like um, if 20% of the cases fail, how do you know that the box is, how, how do you set the timer to where 80% of it passes and only 20% of it fails, I guess is my question from the logic. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, so if I go to the, uh, this timer, uh, we'll go to the logic here and I'm doing free run dice, right? Which is set to 359. But if I would have set it to a thousand, um, 
right, which divides evenly into 100, depending on when the part arrives, it would grab whatever the time was randomly based on when it arrived, and it would divide it by, instead of 60, it would divide it by uh, 100, right, or uh, 10, right? And there I would have zero to 100. And then I would put a set point in there, and I would say if the result is um, above 82, then it fails. So that would be the 18% failure. If above 82, then reject. Then generate a fail signal. So it's not just reject, but generate the actual simulated fail signal from the camera. Gotcha. And then yeah. ideally, I, so you, we talked a little bit about object-oriented programming. I would want to build that into the equivalent of an AOI, right, that represents a camera. So for instance, this thing you see on the screen here is an object that represents, I think, a pair of dice. Yeah, die one and die two, right? So inside of that box is everything it takes to roll those dice. It, there's the timer, um, there's a trigger on the input side, and then there's die one result and die two result. I would build a box that would say simulated Cognex camera. And inside of that, uh, you know, as a set point, uh, since it's simulated, I'll put a set point for a uh, percent fail. And then I will have an output that generates a pass or fail, a physical pass or fail. And then that output would trigger the reject pusher. So I want everything inside of that box, ideally, representing that camera. Okay, and then in my real program, I would have basically all the same, I'd wanna make sure that the simulated camera had the same IO as the real camera. So a good example would be uh, product select. A lot of times um, I'll have a camera like this, it's got little pins on the back and they're digital pins and I say, I want product number four. This thing is programmed to recognize that product number four is a, um, I don't know, a, you know, a telephone like this. And oddly enough, in Cognex, they have this thing called a PatMax. It, I don't like PatMax personally. What it does is it's a pattern matching thing. So I would look at this phone and, you know, it, it would pass or fail it based on the memorized vision of a phone, but it wouldn't tell me, for instance, hey, there's a, there's a four on the middle key instead of a five. Now that's the thing I don't like about PatMax, right? So ideally what I'd like to do is create a separate sensor for everything in here and it would tell me, you're missing the middle, the middle key is the wrong number, you know, or um, you're missing this button or many things, right? This camera has the capability of doing that, but it takes more work. I've got to draw sensors around every single one of these buttons and I've got to recognize the, the number that's in it, which is an optical character recognition thing. So all that exists in the Cognex cameras. They're all capable of doing that. But people are generally pretty lazy and what they do is they, they use PatMax and PatMax does exactly what this number generator thing does. It says um, you have to have a 97% for that phone to be okay. And so phones go through there, right? You're inspecting phones and they're mostly passing and every once in a while one fails and you don't know why it failed. You just know that it was below 97%. You could inspect it again or look at it with your eyes or whatever, but that's the thing I don't like about PatMax. So I tend to put all the separate sensors on here. Um, I'm gonna do a class on machine vision too, but it, it, these courses take so long to record, um, which is why I tend to just be, I, I do the lazy thing, which is record myself writing a program and then just talking over it, right? I can do that in, I, I'd say I'm doing one hour of um, finished video takes me a day, I would say. Whereas if I had to do a Cognex video and explain what every single little section does and how it works, oh, it's, it's an hour per minute, I would say a finished video. There's a lot of editing and I have to really write a serious script. I can't just get up and start talking. 
So those courses are way harder. Um, they take, you know, maybe a couple months for a Cognex course. And I'm not uh, sure that I have all that time. Oh my gosh, there's Carlos. So we've got five people. That's like a, a new record here. <laughs> But in any case, so, so that's, that's the idea behind this, right, is to use the camera. Now, interestingly, uh, Carlos, that's what he does. He has something to do with vision, and his company inspects um, uh, parts or, or does some kind of validation with parts. So, um, so I, I don't know in great detail, but Carlos is actually one of my connections on LinkedIn, so he must have seen this thing here and done that. But does that answer your question, Seven? Kind of to the yeah, yep. greater. Yep, sure, sure does, and it it sounds like you like to keep a lot of your um, you like to keep all the control on the PLC and let the cognates do what the cognates does. For example, just grabbing pixel counts off certain dimensions. You do the uh, logic in the field. Right, and and so we talked a little bit about integration. That's the integration part. Is um, how much of this needs to be in the PLC and how much of it needs to be in the camera. Some people, for instance, uh, there are computer-based vision systems. Um, they're generally, they can be cheaper. Um, you can buy separate components and put together your own vision system. As a matter of fact, Arduino and Raspberry Pi, you have these little toy CCD cameras that you can do all that work yourself. I know a guy who wanted to do that. He wanted to do some simple vision thing. Uh, using the Arduino cameras and my advice to him was I said first off industrially I don't know that it's gonna last you're gonna wire this thing in you may get it to work and you're only sure you're spending a hundred dollars in components that's awesome this this Cognex camera this suckers probably twenty five hundred dollars or two thousand dollars but how much time is he gonna spend doing that and is it gonna be reliable and rugged right is that really what he wants I, I say the same thing for the computer-based vision systems. They're a lot more work. Um, I would say the same trade-off, for instance, if I wanted to buy an automation direct PLC versus buying uh, this fancy Allen Bradley Control Logics PLC. Um, Allen Bradley's super expensive, but it's very, very fast to develop in. It's one of the fastest you know, platforms that there is. Not necessarily the best hardware, not necessarily the, uh, the best, uh, I don't know, method of programming or whatever algorithms, but definitely the easiest to program in and, and therefore one of the fastest. So I can generate, um, I guess the biggest program I've done, uh, it was for about an $8 million machine and it had simulations and it had SCADA and all kinds of things in it. And it took me, I know, two and a half months to write the program for an $8 million machine. Um, there was a lot of code in that thing. I mean, for a control logics, it was an L63 at the time and it was full, uh, absolutely full. And the reason I could do it so fast is all this reusable stuff. That's, that's really the key to Alan Bradley is you can build add-ons, you can build um, this program here. Uh, a great example, I had these testers, they were uh, air filter testers for 3M and they passed a little bit of oil through the thing and there was a lot of mechanical movement and then it would detect on the other side how much of that oil made it through the respirator filter. So all your, uh, the respirators that you use now are the big pink ones, um, you know, if you were to buy the serious ones, um, they've all had just a little bit of oil sent through them and that's how they detect uh, whether they work and every single filter is tested that way. So you know that, hey, you know, nothing's wrong with the manufacturing. Um, that thing had eight testers in it. And the way I did that is I wrote one perfect tester program. I, I say it was perfect. It was not perfect as it turned out. But the idea would be all the tags right in here were specific to tester one. And so I finished tester one. And you can see here, this is a simple simulation. For those who haven't been here on the simulation, this is what I simulated in here. Very simple. Um, and, and this is entirely simulated, right? Uh, that tester had a lot more than this whole thing in it. So just for this, you can see all the tags that I've had to create in here. For a tester, there were five times as many tags just for one tester. 
So I, I wrote the program as perfectly as I could, and then I copied it eight times. And you can't do that with something like an automation direct PLC. Uh, there is no method of separate, you know, making eight duplicates of the same thing. So that's kind of where we get to the object oriented programming part of this, right? Um, it, a tester from my perspective was an object and this program is another object and that object better represent that tester. Now, as it turned out, it was not perfect. And I did have to make changes and I, you know, something would change mechanically on the machine. Oh, well, and now I got to go change it for eight separate things. So I want to say it took me more time to change things in the eight testers than it did to write the first tester. <laughs> you know, that's, that's part of why you want to use rapid code development, but yet the hardware costs more, the software costs more. This software, you know, starts at, I don't know, 2,500 bucks compared to automation direct, their best software is less than a thousand. Um, and it's pretty good. Um, but yet if I had to write it, you know, $8 million machines program on it, I probably couldn't, or it would take me a year. Whereas here it took me two and a half months from start to power up. So that's, that's one of the differences, same kind of thing for these Cognex cameras. Uh, all the brains are in the camera. You don't have any, you have, don't have any brain in the computer. There is no computer, right? You program it with a computer, but the brain is entirely inside of here and it sends whatever information you want. Um, the camera actually in this program would look exactly like uh, the tags in the controller tags up here. So if I had a Cognex camera, I would import the file for the camera and I would break it open. We'll take one of these and it would have a whole bunch of things like this in it. Inputs, outputs, status, all those things, right. Can be broken into, uh, right. Sometimes can be broken into smaller things. That's just channel four, uh, status and all kinds of different things. The camera would have the same thing. So I would get that Pat max score where it would give me a percent fail, but I could also, just like when I was talking about inspecting this phone, I could also get information on every one of those keys and, and the screen and everything else. I, it could tell me specifically what's wrong with this phone if I was inspecting it, but most people don't do that. They, they put, put it under the camera and they get a percentage and Hey, 97% good must be a good phone, right? Well, I don't think you can do that with everything. Some things you really need to know specifically, you know, I don't know, diabetes medicine or something that, you know, a car part that life or death depends on, I suppose. But uh, a phone, eh, it's a throwaway thing. So who cares? <laughs> Any other comments, questions? The rest of you guys. Hello, Carlos. How are you doing? I see you're here. I'm doing good, yes. So I saw the I saw the link at the last minute. You said, what do you really start this? Let me check. Oh, you, oh, you yeah. put well, there, let, let, let's come hang out. I said, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do this every, I'd say every two weeks. Just uh, a heads up, my next uh, thing, I'm going to Miami uh, Wednesday. And Miami is one, my one remaining integration customer. Carlos, I think you and I have talked about it. The guy down there is from Argentina. So that's where I get oh, to go okay. practice all my Spanish, right? Yeah, of course. So this is I've, good. Yeah. I've got, I've got him from Argentina. He speaks good English, but he's got a guy named Umberto from Cuba. And Umberto okay. speaks almost English. But Umberto, uh, his key is he is a wizard with electronic components. So he has this cool workbench down there and he can take a $4,000 Allen Bradley drive and it doesn't matter what's wrong with it, why it burnt up, he can fix it with no schematic. Wow, yeah. awesome. <laughs> so sort of having guys from Cuba, you know, I think they're used to fixing cars with duct tape and, and whatever uh, around, you know. It, it's true, most of the people that I know from Cuba, also it's funny, I was having, when I was working for Siemens, uh, the guy that was managing the office, the, the, he was from Cuba, 
these people are very very smart <laughs> oh yeah and he went to he went to some kind of a uh, engineering school but he said even in his school they didn't have a lot of good stuff to work with so they had to kind of figure things out and then he went to work for some some guy that repaired stuff and he just learned uh i don't i don't know how he does it but of course the owner of the company you know he's a kind of Cadillac now because the owners bought him oscilloscopes and function generators and just uh, <laughs> so he's got all these tools that he never had before and he's just <laughs> he just is a wizard he saves the guy so much money we bring him you know even sensors that you would normally throw away and he'll fix them uh you know put them back pressure transducers whatever uh, so but, but the, this is one of the things that these people from there sometimes they don't have these possibilities so when they have the opportunity they just they just go 100 uh, into it you know some people that are used to use this maybe here in college and these things then they don't appreciate that this is yeah. a huge difference yeah one of the things he's <laughs> struggling with uh he's trying to learn kind of plc programming and i've been trying to help him he's got my book we had a class down there uh, where Juan Pablo uh, kind of did the interpretation for me and I'd draw stuff on the board and I, you know, gave him the book, but because, you know, almost no English, he's he struggled a little bit. And so he had a project down there. We did a, a, a CIP machine uh, last summer and he was kind of supposed to do it and he, he, he didn't get very far. So I kind of ended up having to go down there and finish it but it's kind of like anything else. It's part of what I'm putting in the automation academy. You know, you got to figure out what your, what your career is going to be. Uh, and then yeah. you, you got to kind of, you don't have enough time to do everything. I would love uh -huh. that kind of electronics, you know, you know, I'd Same love to, learn, to me. Yeah. I'd love to learn Arduino and raspberry Pi. I bought all the stuff. I would love to be able to build little components and do integration of objects like this, build a little thing, that I can, you know, talk to and make it work. But the time, right? It, I have this stuff sitting on a bench and I don't have the time to get to it. Same, same, same exactly problem that I have. Same, man. So it, it, the problem before was like, a, okay, before there is not too much information. If you want something specific like that, you have to go for trainings with the manufacturer or something like that. These days, you have all the information in there, but you don't have the time. That's exactly <laughs> right. So. Yeah, so Seben and I have, have talked a little bit back and forth um, about integration, and he he uh, he has a question that I'm going to try to answer on my blog about uh, OPC UA, which is okay. some of you guys know what some of that uh, is. Uh, OPC used to be what they called only for process control, and uh -huh. was it important? Well, from my perspective, the only thing that was important about it was. I could take information from a PLC and stick it into an Excel spreadsheet without, uh, you know, using like an RS links driver or much of anything, right? I could just use the built in capabilities uh, of Excel. Well, that's changed, right? Um, for one thing, people have wanted to, to tie to other things that aren't windows based. So OPC used to stand for OLI, which was object linking and embedding. So we've been talking about objects um, for process control. And then they changed the whole definition. So if you look at OPC now, it's uh, object um, unified architecture is the UA part, but it's uh, object, um, do, you, do you remember the acronym, Seven? I think it was. I want to say it was open something, but I can't quite remember. Uh, I think it was object, object, uh, but I don't remember what the P stood for. But but it was it was basic, and then unified architecture. The basic idea behind it, and again, I don't know great detail, but Seven asked me this the other day, so I kind of did a little research on it. And what it is is um, I, I see drivers for OPC and OPC UA in various things. If they're Windows things, you could use either. But in if I had something like a Cognex camera, right, this is definitely not Windows. So for me to communicate with something I've never talked to before, OPC UA opened it up and I can talk to Linux and I can talk to Android phones. And so it made a lot of tools available, but what I understand about it is it also, it has to package all the information about communicating with all those different things in it, even if you're not using it. 
right? So uh, I don't want to talk to an Android, but the capability is in this OPC UA package. So do I care necessarily how to use it? Um, not necessarily, right? I, I know it's there and I know what the difference between it and OPC is, but the, I, I can't count on one hand the, the times that I've ever had to use even OPC or OPC UA. Um, I tend to use packaged things. Uh, I know people ha have made all kind of cool little widgets on board level stuff with microprocessors and whatever, but most customers won't allow you to use that. <laughs> that's the reality. You, you know, they want something that's tried and true and is not an experiment. So uh, it's very rare that I have to talk to something that doesn't have the protocols built in. I would say the exception would be there are way scales that haven't entered the industrial age yet and the customer buys a way scale and I've got to talk to it, right? And I may have to take uh, literally text, right? And build strings and bring the text in and use comma delimited stuff and, and figure it out that way. So in that case, is that OPC? No, it's not. It's still not OPC. It's, it's just text strings over RS-232. So um, the protocols that I end up running into all the time, lots of Ethernet protocols, right? Um, so for Alan Bradley, it's um, Ethernet IP. For Siemens, it's Profinet. For, uh, for Beckhoff, it's Ethercat, right? So they all have their different protocols and I don't have an Alan Bradley PLC that can speak Ethercat. So I have to figure out a way to get from Ethernet IP to Ethercat. But they build a little box that converts, you know, Ethernet IP to Ethercat. Or they build another little box that is literally a server and I can feed Ethernet IP, map it to some tags internally and pass the tags out uh, via Ethercat. So it's kind of a which one do you want to pick? If I've got to talk to this thing and they're two different languages, how do I get from one language to the other? I guess that's, that's kind of, and, and I'm going to write a whole thing up. I, I haven't figured out a way to put this in the Automation Academy yet for details like what, you know, Seven and I have had a couple emails back and forth and he asked some really good questions. And I would really, I'm, I'm leaning towards turning the Automation Academy much more into a, a higher level, um, um, systems integrator school, if you want to call it that. Sure, there's PLC courses on here. That's a lot of what I do. I still teach a lot of PLC and HMI stuff, but there's a lot more to it, right? So for instance, I get maintenance guys, they don't want to learn how to program a PLC. They really want to learn how to troubleshoot. So uh, Phil mentioned something about a, uh, th there's a, a three phase uh, system simulator uh, that, you, you know, IEEE is advertising or whatever. And I would love to have something like that here, right? Where I could bring uh, my students in and have them troubleshoot a drive or, or whatever and screw up a system and, you know, screw up the e-stops and the drive and the program and everything, and then have them figure out what the, the problem is. But I don't know how you do that entirely online that, you know, or teach people how to do that, right? Um, so you almost have to have these physical things and I have the same issue with how do I create a, a systems integration course that discusses all of these different topics like uh, OPC UA or how do you find faults in systems or how do you write um, interfaces between things because everything is different, right? So I can pick, you know, like I said, machine vision and talk about how to talk to that because I've done it before. But if somebody came to me and said, how do I... Uh, make this Android phone, um, I don't know, uh, get into this Cognex camera. That would be a good example. How do I do that directly? Uh, there is no method, right? But that's what integrators do. They take the customer's requirements, which says, I want to take this Android phone and I want to look through the lens of the Cognex camera and see the things that are being inspected. Oh, by the way, I want the totals right, for the passes and fails to appear in a little box in the corner of the phone. Can that be done? Absolutely, right? And, and so that's what the job of an integrator is. It's to figure out all the things that it takes to get to that, which might even bring in your OPC UA. 
question, right? That that's where you'd have to research it. But would you need to know how OPC UA works? Not really. So for instance, I know Ethernet has seven layers, and I know that one is a physical or maybe two are physical layers having to do with the wiring and that some are having to do with the frames and the protocols. Have I ever had to dig into that and and use that information, right, to take apart Ethernet and figure out what the individual bits mean? Nope. Never had to do it. Um, never had to do it for RS-232. I know what the stop bits are. I know what RS, all that stuff means, but would I become an expert in that? No, but I would have to learn about it, right? And learn what it is and how to use it. And I would say the same is true for all these thousands of protocols. So the best I can do, probably uh, I, what I thought I'm gonna do is create a systems integrator course and start with probably what I'm doing Sunday, which is I'm writing a blog on what is systems integration? What is a system and how do you integrate it, right? My daughter asked me that. She runs a branding company and she's worked with me for years because uh, she, she actually did welding and ran the mill in my shop, but she's 33 years old now and runs a branding company. She's still asking me, uh, Dad, I know kind of what a PLC is and I know what PLC programming, but you're writing, you want me to write ad copy for systems integration. I don't know what it is. And I don't have a place I can exactly point to her and say, well, this is what, uh, you know, somebody might say it's, it's tying an Android phone to your home automation system. That systems integration. Other people might say, well, automation is making things happen automatically on your computer screen. And other people like me would say automation is, you know, manufacturing things, making things, transferring juice from the, the tanks through the pasteurizers to whatever. So what is systems integration? I'm going to start there. And then I'm going to start maybe putting together some, you know, I, I wrote a blog a long time ago on on acronyms and buzzwords, you know, what do all these things mean? What is, and I still can't remember, what does OPC UA mean? I, I remember OLI and I remember the old OPC and I remember TCP IP and HTML and all these acronyms, but there's thousands of them. And, you know, they all mean different things to, to different people, so. Sure. OP, OPC is Open Platform Communication. Yeah, Open Platform Communication, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, there's another definition I found that was something, uh, object, object something. Uh, I'd have to find it, but I typed, it, it's funny because you, yeah, you get different things and you don't know that you're necessarily getting them from the right source. Let's see if any of the other ones come up. And Frank, just to clarify my question in that email about OP OPC, I guess, the way I was coming at it from the question standpoint was, you know, there's always a design consideration when choosing certain protocols over others. For example, uh, Modbus. Using Modbus for a high-speed application is suicide, essentially, right? right? So, yeah. <laughs> um, and so maybe something like Ethercat could be used for that. So I guess from an OPC UA versus MQTT versus Ethernet IP, use cases and when to use certain protocols and why to use them would be would be kind of the angle I was going for from the OPC standpoint. Hey, why is OPC UA used? What, what specific characteristics of OPC UA makes it a good protocol to use it in this design case or something along those lines? Is that, uh, that, that was kind of the frame in which I was thinking. Okay, okay. Well, and, and in, like I said, in my case, um, every plant, if you work with bigger plants, they are generally going to be specced on a brand, on a, on a kind of a, um, the exception is this Miami plant. Like I said, they've got Siemens Allen Bradley GE. I, I want to say automation direct and some obscure stuff. And some things aren't PLCs at all, right? There's chart recorders and there's whatever. So um, if I'm doing Allen Bradley, it's kind of a no brainer. I'm going to use Ethernet IP because that's what they've got. Um, they don't have anything faster. They don't have anything better. And because of that, you know, the plant themselves would choose Allen Bradley drives. They would choose Cognex cameras uh, simply because they're Ethernet IP, right? Even though Ethernet IP is not as fast as EtherCAT. So I would never change to EtherCAT, even though I could probably get there from Allen Bradley. Um, 
Siemens would sit there in a, in a trade show and just go on all day about how Profinet was so much faster than and, and more accurate and everything else for motion control than, um, than Ethernet IP. That's true. Uh, and EtherCAT is even faster than that. But if you're all Alan Bradley and your servos move fast enough, right, which they do, uh, I, I was doing stuff with the old uh, Circos and had no problem at all. And Circos wasn't, from what I can tell, as fast as the Ethernet IP stuff was. So I would pick, you know, for those big companies, I would probably be forced to pick a brand. I, I really wouldn't have a choice. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to go in and say, you know, I really like uh, Mitsubishi drives. So I'm going to use Mitsubishi drives with my Allen Bradley controller. Uh, you know, the, the customer would tell me that. So I, I've just rarely run into a situation where I can choose any of that. The, the obscure parts would be, like I said, some of those way scale things or in the, back in the day, zebra printers. Uh, a lot of people use, still today use zebra printers. And if you've got a stick, um, a, a formatted label in there, the only way to do that right now is to use a computer a Windows computer, because that's the only software they have, and you literally draw your label on the computer and that's what it prints. But if you've got stuff that is needing to populate it and change sizes, and you gotta do it in a PLC, the option would be send the signal to the computer, let the computer do the printing, or format everything with a PLC, bypass the computer completely, and duplicate all the functionality of the software that was already in there. That's what I ended up having to do. They didn't want to have the computer. And at the time, uh, I want to say it was in the 90s. So we didn't really even have much in the way of Ethernet. It was kind of all serial stuff. And I, that was one of the reasons I didn't want to send something to the computer, let the computer send it to the printer. It wasn't fast enough. So I had to do it straight out of the, out of the PLC. But it's just rare that I've had to choose um, a protocol other than uh, I did a building management job, had to convert uh, Ethernet IP to BACnet. And uh, there were two ways to do it. There was a directly something that would just convert the Ethernet IP language into the BACnet language. But uh, it, the formatting, when it would arrive on the other side, was all mixed up. And you would have had to take apart all the bits and and format them in the PLC. It wasn't economical, so I bought something called a field server, and I just researched it online. It was made by ProSoft, which are the same guys that make a lot of these protocol converters and things, or special purpose cards in Allen Bradley or Siemens. So uh, in that case, I had to research that, but, but it's so rare anymore uh, that I've had to do that. Everything nowadays, uh, you know, people partner up, SMC and Festo both have stuff for Alan Bradley and, uh, and Siemens, right? Um, Siemens tends to lean more toward the Festo stuff, I guess, since it's German, but um, that's where my choices come from a lot of times, but yeah. Gotcha. Well, well uh, I feel your pain. Zebra printer uh, logic from APLC doesn't sound fun at all, so. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. And, and neither is, so So speaking of that, I had a guy, uh, loved Cognex, built on a, um, on a computer. He didn't like the little smart cameras. He knew that the computer will do more, it, that's true. Uh, so he built everything before I even got to the company on a computer. Well, we were, lin we were sending comma delimited strings over RS links. It, it, you know, it would do the communications part, but the, the thing wouldn't do anything other than send me strings. And I had to build a bunch of pre-populated strings and then I had to take the strings apart when I'd get them back for dimensions and sizes and uh, colors and, and whatever he would, he would give to me. And that's where some of the integration stuff comes in. You, you get what you get and you can't dictate necessarily to the customer what he's going to put in. So you're kind of stuck with what you got, I guess. Gotcha. That, that'd be actually some logic that'd be really interesting to look at. Um, I'd say uh, string parsing, for example, that kind of stuff. That that's yeah. I haven't had a lot of experience with that yet, but that's, that's a good one for sure. It's not it's not bad. Um, the the only tip I would give you there uh, that you could, you know, since it's getting toward the end here, um, the only tip I would get you there that that I found a kind of a neat little trick is create pre-done strings with names. 
in other words, tags that are a string with something like a comma in it and call it comma. <laughs> Literally, you make a tag named comma and it's a string tag, it's 82 characters or whatever and all it's got in it is one character, which is a comma. But when it came time to write the actual code in the string parsing, uh, it became a lot easier to simply grab the thing that said comma rather than trying to remember what the numbers were for all the different characters, the at sign or whatever, or look them up in a table. So I created strings ahead of time for, I think one was named ampersand, one was named comma. Um, I, I had pre-populated strings that were just a list of tags. And again, the object oriented part of that is, could I put it in a UDT today? Yeah, I would. And, and I would call them, I don't know, uh, Com, com tags or something like that, right? ASCII tags. I guess that would be a way to do it. But I am, that's my next step is I really am going to create some courses on kind of systems integration. Just start with what is systems integration and then start bringing some case studies of how to, how to basically design systems and and uh, and make things talk to each other and you know start with the io list and the um you know what we learned in college i think most of the guys in this list are engineers or you've been to some kind of engineering college that you know they for engineering it's here's the information you're given here's what you have to find if you can divide those two things up and throw out all the extra stuff that has nothing to do with what you're working on right oh, by the way, the walls are blue, right? Who cares, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so I guess that's, I'm leaning toward doing that more than when I started the Automation Academy, I really thought my target audience was poor guys from India and, and, uh, and Africa that couldn't afford my book and, and, or any of my books or my or training courses that cost $150 online, you know? So I thought, well, if I do a membership group and I get a whole bunch of them in there, they can all take the courses cheap. But it doesn't turn out that that's probably what the audience is going to be, as evidenced by uh, you guys. You know, <laughs> I think Phil's working on his PhD, and Seven, you seem like a guy who knows a lot about um, uh, protocols and different things. I know Jet's brought up some things that he's he's working on from a technical standpoint. Uh, uh, Carlos, do you run your company, or are you a uh, uh, you're an officer in your company, kind of, aren't you? Well, three years running my business now. I'm very happy uh, for this decision. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. 16 years working for others, uh, for, the, uh, for other people's dreams. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. so in the pharma industry mostly, and now I'm doing the same thing, but, but by my own and developing my own thing and these kind of things and learning. I never stop learning. So this industry uh, 3.0, that is automation, yep. is what is out there. But now the people are starting moving and, and developing uh, industry 4.0. That is connecting all this automation and this data uh, to, to cloud systems and, and uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all these processes. So it's awesome what is happening there. That now it's just not it's not just uh, using the PNC and this stuff to control the machine. Now this data have a lot of value uh, to to move it uh, up to the Scala system, MES, ERP system, cloud systems, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. That this is what is doing industry 4.0 and industrial Internet of Things, digital yeah. transformation. So a lot of things to learn there. I'm I'm on, on this way. <laughs> Yeah, and the, the bad thing about that is you end up focusing on one brand of something or one, you know, uh, you've seen Derek Stickle. I think you've been on some of his posts. On oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, Good ones, uh, normal ones, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I got into trouble with him a little bit because I started talking about ignition, right? Ignition. Oh. And I use, I use a lot of ignition. I like ignition. Oh, so you, you, you know he's free anymore. <laughs> Well, no, it's just he, no. He say he say emission is not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what he said, you know. And it's like, well, I'll tell you what, you know, it does everything we need it to do, and it was cheaper. And then he started, you know, I was I was on board with him until he started talking about how great Wonderware was, and I was like, well, wait a minute. Now, I teach Wonderware. I know Wonderware, and I know it ignition, and I would choose ignition every day. <laughs> Every day, wow. it's a the price, and it does twice as much. 
I mean, I can. I, do, I, yeah. So I don't know. I learn. I learn. I I start learning this one. So uh, the induction software. Yeah. I try to learning about this software and yeah, the capability. So the the thing that you have, HMI, Scala, and ME system in one platform is like a what? <laughs> yeah. And like you say, there is a lot of information uh, out there. Uh, so. So the capabilities are awesome. So they are running MQTT protocols now for most of the things. The easy thing, the easy way to connect many stuff. The the initial edge now for the small devices. The yep. they 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 give you a license for for two hours limit with all the capabilities, so you can learn whatever you want about that. And that there, I, this the is, university is great because you can learn all kind of stuff there. Yeah, for free. Exactly. So this is not happening with the other guys. <laughs> so right. You want to, you want this training for one piece? To, if I say, well, if I why if I if I would uh, uh, add or something, if I would uh, try to understand the value of the training that they're offering, is thousand of dollars in there. Absolutely. Yeah. In training, if you would pay that in other brands. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, and I, many, I, many thousands. I, I told the rest of the guys, I'm headed to Miami this week, and that's for the next two weeks. That's a lot of what I'm going to be doing in that plant. It's ignition related and working with all the different PLCs there. And my next live event is going to be from there. So two weeks from wow. today, and I'm going to do it from ABD, which is my only real systems integration customer anymore. Uh, I, I just know the owner really well, and he has no problem with me, uh, you know, streaming from his plant and pointing my camera around and showing some other stuff. So that's what I'll be awesome. doing. Yeah, it should be fun. Yeah. You, if you need someone uh, carrying your tools, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things about it is uh, we have these big face shields. We have a mask on under that, right? And, it's okay. Yeah. And it, I have it. There's no air conditioning, right? But I think my yeah. right now. This is the time to go down there, December. It's not bad. So. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Wow, but this is awesome. Yeah. If you were going there. So, man, and, and about that, it's like a, with, with, like you say, with the Raspberry Pi and these kind of things, man, you can do a lot of things there. Also, the one that you was mentioning with the phone, you can use in your phone the, the web browser and you can access MQTT with right. Mosquito Server running. And maybe use no red and everything. And you will have in your phone whatever you have in your computer. You can do your home automation with your with that if you want. You can, you can, but every time you open up that can of worms, you end up in a giant security issue. Oh and, yeah. And if you're gonna rely on <laughs> this is this else, is for yeah, security software. This is for a, yeah. for education thing. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's part of it. Um that it, you know, there yeah, lots of cans of worms in there when you start uh integrating things and all of a sudden when it's when i'm responsible all of a sudden i'm very picky about what i choose and and what i bring into a plant now as it is i work oh, yeah. on the miami plant from here a lot i i go right into their server and use a um you know vm and, yeah vpn VPN, yeah, VPN yeah. into the vm there and uh and i work on the machines online but the fact is if you have a connection like that somebody else can get in there too if they want to oh, of course, yeah, yeah. I have a customer from Italy that I'm working right now the same way, remotely, every time that they have a problem. And yeah, it's like you say, it's like, a, but at this point, I have no option. It's, it's just th that this or, or not running production. That's right. <laughs> but for the for the other thing with the Raspberry Pi, I, yeah, I'm just doing like internal networks, not not connected to the, to the Wi-Fi or anything like that, so... Yep. To the external thing for the same reason that you mentioned, but yep. to well, learn, this Carlos, is the way. <laughs> consider coming in uh, here to the academy and, and providing some of that stuff. Uh, I would love to have a group that kind of dealt with some of those microprocessor level things. Uh, Jet, I know, is maybe thinking about doing some of that too. I haven't had time to do it. I've got the stuff. I've actually got books on it and all kind of exercises and you know it'd be fun to sit down and learn it but man um <laughs> you know i'm already involved in so many things it's kind of just a choice of, of what to work on but a lot of times if i have a goal in mind um, i know jet's going to be working on a um some kind of a simulation program he's bought a little 800 plc and he's going to put together something and he wants a, a project to work on and i think the arduino stuff 
that's that's good and low cost and board level and you can make it do just about anything so um, great way to tinker and create something that um, it, you know is a, I don't know recordable <laughs> no man honestly this is this is awesome so is with there, uh, when you start looking for has very fine stuff one there is one very very smart guy he, he, he this blow my mind. He just used the, the Raspberry Pi, the last one that is with 8 gigabytes of RAM. He installed VMware in, internally and run three, three virtual machines at the same time with this thing. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you'd fit that, you know, they, they don't have a lot of memory on those things. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's not like you would run a plant with that, but the possibility to install VMware and have three virtual machines uh, running. Uh, with all, all, not, not with high power, the power of, of our, our resources is the only limitation of that. But the, the possibility to have it is like, a, I okay. don't know, it's, it's crazy. They are using also with the cameras OpenCV, that is the protocol for Python for, for, for camera stuff. You can do face recognition, uh, inspections, whatever you want say, with this uh, library yeah. in the Raspberry Pi. So to, for learning purposes, it's, it's awesome for me. So because yeah. the only thing that you will have to do is apply the same thing with a computer with more resources, but the process is the same. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I have a feeling I'm going to do be doing more reading about it than I am actually implementing it. And just the lack of time is the problem. Uh, same happened to me. Yeah. All right. And the problem is that you start looking what you 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 want, find one information and there is ten more that you like it. Because the algorithm of, of YouTube knows what you want, and they give you more and more and more. And sometimes I spend hours on on these things. Yeah, but then I had to run the business. It's like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So part of my dilemma, for instance, uh, inductive automation, inductive university. I'm I'm working on that system down there. I'm not an ignition expert, uh, but when I have a goal in mind, I have to learn how to do whatever that one thing is. So we're doing some some things with barcode readers. He literally, he brings everything in his plant, human resources, payroll, everything's on ignition, including wow. tracking, <laughs> tracking, yeah, um, parts from the raw juice, from the when the stuff gets shipped in, through the batches, through putting it in boxes, and then shipping it out to the customer. And literally everything has to be tracked, uh, you know, via barcode readers and, and uh, trying to figure out when the juice got from the giant tank into the little box and which tank did it come from. And so that's a lot of what I'm doing with all the ignition stuff. And wow. I don't take the whole inducted university to do that. I, I learn the little part of it that I need to learn to uh -huh. accomplish that task. Right. So it's not, it's not like you're going to become an expert at every part of it. It's just like you learn the part you need. <laughs> exactly and they make it easy when I saw the videos how they connect thing, click here click here click here put the IP address here enter save done what <laughs> yeah there's still a little <laughs> bit <of it. laughs> uh -huh, but, but the basic stuff because I'm starting I'm 8% of, of, of completion yeah. <laughs> I, a lot of things to work but it is it's easier than, than before yeah oh no doubt yeah it's definitely easier than the old wonderware stuff was and stuff well, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call it a day here. We got uh, an hour and 20 minutes of, of fun here. And uh, like I said, the next one I'm going to do open from the plant. And any topic is fair game. Uh, if you guys have stuff that you want me to address specifically, um, you know, you can send it to me by email or, or within the site, you know, uh, leave me messages there and, and I'll try to set something up next time that, that will be practical, uh, kind of show you the, the, my playground down there, which is kind of nice. It's my one remaining customer there. I spend my time either teaching people doing, doing that work down there a few times a year or um, traveling and teaching people or doing this website. Right. So that's, that's what all my time spent doing now. Um, and it doesn't seem like there's much time for anything else. So <laughs> this happened. Yeah. It's like, uh, I figured out that, Sometimes we want to do things ourselves. This is, happened to me. We, we want to maintain the quality of what we do and our, and our brand and everything. But for me, it's like a man. If I if I don't hire more people, there is no way that I will can span because it's it's twenty four hours a day and you just have two hands. So for me, this is my stop my stopper. Yeah, I had employees. I had fifteen employees back in the nineties through about two thousand six, and I spent more time dealing with employees than I did doing the technical stuff. Um, so this that was less time. 
Yeah. Same thing to me. Yeah. And this one, you need the human resources and someone maybe managing the people and the team. That's right. Yeah. But then, then we, 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 it is, I love the integration part and the technical part. So it's, but in business, you have to choose or you manage the business or you work uh, with the stuff that you like it. So do the both things at the same time. It's a really challenge. Yeah, so I, I chose not to do the, the machine building part of it and, and much of the integration. <laughs> it's more fun to teach. It's eight hours okay. a day. I get into these integration things, but and they're, they're more like 12-hour days, six to seven days a week. When I'm down there, I'm generally working, but, um, but awesome. I enjoy it, and it's only two weeks at a time. It's not all year. So This is what, this is what I'm doing right now, doing what I enjoy and love to do. You know, I, I want to feel that I'm not working and this is, this is the way. Exactly. So do what you like and, and, and you will be happy. So you will not feel that you're working. This is what exactly. happened to me now. Well, um, actually I had somebody else just enter um, the, the room. I'm not really sure why they may have done it from the site. It's hard to tell, but it was great that all you guys, uh, you know, showed up. And um, Thank I hope you. to, like I said, I hope to hold these regularly and, uh, and, uh, so I, I see a name down here, Dare, Dare EWC. Um, not sure who that is, but he stepped in right at the end of the meeting here, and uh, we had we got to talk about got to talk about yeah. yeah. So who is this? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Uh, my name is Daryl Cunningham. Oh, Daryl. Okay. Yeah, we, we're actually just finishing up. <laughs> um, oh, I got in late, didn't I? Whoa. Oh, yeah, You're, we started about an hour and a half ago. Um, but but still, oh. like I, I was telling the rest of the guys, uh, I'm going to do this again in two weeks from Miami. Uh, it's a company called American Beverage Depot, and it's where I do a lot of work. Um, they've got a little bit of everything down there. Um, most of what I'm down there doing is working with Ignition, uh, grabbing data from some Siemens PLCs and some Allen Bradley. And uh, we may be doing a little bit of Cognex work down there, but that's, that's where the next, uh, the next one of these webinars will be from is down there from the plant. So, cool. but uh, the rest of the guys, uh, it was great, great seeing all you guys here. And um, I think I'm going to probably finish this up and um, Daryl, sorry, sorry. We didn't catch you there at the beginning, but yeah, this is going to be a probably every two week thing, except the the one after Christmas lands on New Year's Day. We won't do New Year's Day. We'll probably do it okay. at that time. But um, I'll just I'll keep an eye out uh, uh, for the next one. There, I just probably didn't pay attention to the timeline. Where did you Where did you find this? Uh, LinkedIn. Okay, LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah I follow you. That's okay. It's, it's something that actually is within this, uh, this little site I have called the Automation Academy. And eventually, it's only going to be within that site. But uh, for a little while here, I kind of opened it up to everybody. And, and you and uh, one other guy here are actually not, not part of the, uh, the academy itself. But I'll still probably the next one will be uh, definitely live like this. I'll post it on LinkedIn still too. But okay. Great. Great seeing everybody. And um, uh, hope you got something out of it today. Oh yeah, thank you, man. Was 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 awesome. Was awesome. These kind of things. Great. Well, appreciate it, guys. Thanks, Evan and Jet. I haven't heard Jet yet. And Phil, I I heard you briefly there. <laughs> All right. No problem. It's great. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye now. We'll see you. See you in Miami. Ah, exactly. yeah, there you go. Come on, come on I have to hold you. I can't hold your camera or something. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye bye. We'll see you, man. Yeah.